Uh, Jerry will be introducing her co-presenter, Sarah Salter, who is one of our special guest lecturers today. Before we get started, and before I turn the program over to Jerry, just a brief announcement. We are going to be serving lunch um, at the break at about 12.15. Lunch will be available to be picked up at the registration desk just outside the lecture hall. And if you would like to bring your lunches back into the lecture hall, we're going to be showing a film called For Richer, For Poorer, um, which is a, a new film produced by the National Film Board of Canada, which I'm sure that you'll find very, very informative and interesting. Would you please welcome Jerry Waldman. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> um, it's particularly nice to finally have a forum to deal with the issue of support, and I'm so excited that I actually get to talk about it this morning because it's been bothering me for more than a year since the trilogy of cases came out. Um, and every time I go to a program and I listen to uh, Mr. McLeod, I want to get up and say, let us talk, let us talk, give the women a chance to have a say. So we're going to have our chance to have our say this morning, finally. Uh, I'm going to um, turn the floor over first to Sarah Salter, who um, has a doctorate in law from Georgetown University. Uh, Sarah teaches law and economics and feminist advocacy at the New York School, New England School of Law, and she's been involved in various research projects, uh, one in particular uh, concerning women in taxation. And as I understand Sarah from my conversations with her, her focus is on how the economic power of women has been co-opted. Now, Sarah is not going to be addressing herself specifically to the issues of battered women. You are? Not to some extent. To some extent, but, <laughs> but what we're going to hear today is a lot of information, and I think very important information, also about um, the whole question of economics and women in general. And I don't think that we can look at the issue of support without having a good understanding of the issues of women and economics. And I believe that that's an issue that has been very much neglected by people looking at this area and by the courts itself. And I'm hopeful that we will be able to take some of the information that Sarah is providing us with today and use it when we conduct trials to make the points that have to be made about why women require spousal support and about the real economic issues for women in society currently. Sarah. Thank you, Jerry. As a specialist in um, law and economics on the one hand and advocacy on the other, um, I've come in my teaching to develop a subspecialty which I call forensic economics. Um, this is not a new category. Forensic economists already testify, for example, in actions where a spouse has been killed in a, a tort action to establish the value of services that are now not available to the survivor. Um, and forensic economics have many other uh, applications. The economics we're talking about today, of course, are the economics of support and the situation, the economic situation facing a woman and, or a man, uh, but most specifically from my expertise, a woman, in the job market um, and in the uh, other sources of support available to her upon um, leaving her uh, current domestic arrangements. Um, I will be speaking about the battered woman, not about the battered man, because that's the ground of my expertise. Um, women are in a very different economic situation, and battered women, as a subset of women in general, are in a very different economic situation from men. And it is to that situation that I'm going to address my remarks. Um, I think that um, a quote that I have from uh, Women's Aid in the UK, an organization that aids women uh, who are trying to uh, organize their lives after departing from a battered, battering spouse, um, have, has a lot to say about what, where we are and why we are here. Um, the quote is this, we at Women's Aid feel that it is a measure of the way that society views violence against women in the home and the relative positions of women and men, men in general, that we are here to talk about women uprooting themselves from their homes and having to build new lives when it is men who are the problem in this specific situation. But it is the women who are uprooting themselves, the women who are having to build new economic lives as well as new lives in other aspects of their existence. The 
first primary factor about battered women as a subset of women in general and about their economic disadvantage is the danger that they face. In the investigation of wife beating training course that the Chiefs of Police Association has developed, the people are instructed, the officers are instructed as they uh, investigate the alleged crime to always ask the victim if she has sustained injuries that do not show. Battered wives frequently sustain internal injuries to the stomach, breast area, portion of the head covered by hair, and the back. Pregnant women are often hit or kicked in the stomach. The absence of external injury, therefore, does not mean that the victim has not been assaulted. Part of our work as lawyers will be to attempt to assess and recover for that injury in formal proceedings, either tort or in support proceedings. Another part of our counseling and planning with the client will be to develop a training program and a psychiatric treatment program to deal with the internal injuries, the injuries that do not show, and the injuries that have a dramatic impact upon the economic situation of the battered spouse. The first factor that distinguishes the battered woman from other women in her situation in general, of building, other women who are building new lives, is the danger. Half of all the women who are killed in homicides are killed by their spouses. Excuse me, I smell something burning. Is it okay? Okay. <laughs> well, if I know at the moment, I'll let you know at the okay. moment. The danger is real. It's demonstrated and it's always there. Women, therefore, must leave their homes very quickly on occasion, and they must leave with less. Most advisors, and you will be talking to many of them today, who have ha had uh, practical expertise in this area, suggest that you always advise the woman to leave with the children if there is any uh, possibility of doing so. Only in cases of extreme physical danger should she leave and abandon the children. From the point of view of support, however, it is always good to advise a woman who's had the opportunity to counsel for counsel in advance to leave with any cash, any bank books to join accounts lying around, uh, and a lot of papers upon which to build a claim. Bank records, tax records, uh, deeds, insurance records, pension records, any kinds of economic records that would relate to the situation of the husband or of the couple as an economic entity in the past. But because of the danger, it's not always possible for a woman to do this. It's also standard advice in these situations to advise a woman to take as much personal property as she will immediately need, clothing, toiletries, and household goods. Again, it's not always possible because of the danger for the woman to do this. When the woman does have to go back into the home to seek the property, she should always have someone with her, preferably a professional. Frequently a police officer may be available, although <clears throat> at um, uh, the schedule arranged by the police department to accompany a woman in this situation. But the danger is foremost, and no concerns of property or support should be allowed to overshadow the fact that there is real danger here. <clears throat> this also holds with the standard advice of trying to hold possession of the matrimonial home. Obviously, it's a good idea to not to yield possession if one doesn't have to of almost anything, possession being the proverbial nine-tenths. But if you're in danger, it's absolutely necessary that you do so or that you advise your client to do so. The second issue, besides the danger itself, the physical imminent danger, is the existence of a very vindictive spouse. This is a situation of social and individual pathology. This is not just an unusually intense level of the usual anger of rejection on divorce and separation. This is a pathology. One of its aspects is the damage that the spouse can do, either to the client, to the children, and to the personal property left behind. An extreme case of this involves a case where the, uh, sp uh, the battered spouse had been given custody of the matrimonial home. 
and the children were there with her. And at least she was not at home when this happened, but the vindictive batterer spouse came with a bulldozer and leveled the house, his own property in which he had an equitable interest, although she had possession. But this, this vindictiveness extends to self-injury, and that is one reason why it's characterized as pathology. The vindictive spouse will do things that are irrational from a point of view of economic um, maximization. The second aspect of vindictiveness is the um, unscrupulous and energetic use of connections to attempt to reestablish the power dynamic of the relationship. Perhaps not the relationship as it was, but the power dynamic of the relationship. Obviously, this power dynamic served a very intense psychological need for the batterer, and this, there is therefore a very intense drive to reestablish it. The levers that the batterer has with respect to establishing this power dynamic connection are initially, of course, money. Support money, joint property to be uh, divided, the house itself, rights in the house, and children. A third area besides money and children are the friends and connections, the social nexus in which the uh, battered person finds herself. One very quick example, it would be fairly customary for a woman to go to stay with her family or with her friends if she were uh, leaving her, ha her matrimonial home uh, for one reason or another. But in the case of the battered woman, this is not often advisable because the batterer is, has been known, A, to threaten the friends and relatives, B, to attempt to charm and cozen them, and C, to use their moral pressure to the extent it can be mustered in order to uh, pressure the battered spouse to return or at least to accede to uh, situations in which the power dynamic can be reestablished. One of the uh, bits of advice given in this situation uh, to women who are leaving a very dangerous situation is don't even tell your family or friends where you're going. Don't give them the address of the halfway house or the uh, shelter. Give, give them perhaps a phone number, give them contact information, but don't tell them where you are because the batterer will use every psychological and perhaps even physical weapon at his disposal to find this out. The third element with respect to the vindictive spouse is the problem, of course, with ongoing support, which Jerry is going to address in more detail. We do need, an, in this area, an empirical study to see if battered, battering spouses are less likely to pay support, even less likely to pay support, I might ask, add, than uh, spouses in general. It is my anecdotal feeling that they are uh, because of the vindictiveness and the use of the lever. Uh, but I think that an empirical study would be useful to identify this and perhaps to bring evidence in connection with what uh, kinds of arrangements need to be made for collection, enforcement, and assurance of support uh, in the initial uh, setting of the support element itself. The second need in this area, of course, is to better for collections, but that goes not only to the battered spouse situation, that goes to all spousal situations in connection with support. Most empirical studies show that only about 15% of men pay regularly, uh, or supporting spouses pay regularly support payments. <clears throat> the next element that distinguishes the battered spouse from other spouses is the damage that she has suffered in the battering relationship. We've spoken a little bit about the nature of the injuries here, not just the external injuries, which as a matter of sound practice should be documented as soon as possible by med medical workers, photographs, etc. But the psychological injuries, these injuries are acute in most cases, and they are extremely relevant to her economic situation. One of the characteristics of the experience of a battered spouse is isolation. It's part of the pathology for the batterer to create so much unpleasantness and so many psychological manipulations to alienate and dis 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 lodge any connections that the battered spouse has within the home to her family, her friends, her neighbors, her workmates if she's in the job market. This isolation factor is an identifiable part of the pathology 
And technically, I believe it arises from the need of the batterer for this dependence of the battered spouse upon the batterer. Dependence by cutting off any other area of social connection. At any rate, pathologically, this is part of the uh, scenario in most battering situations. This uh, extensive, deliberate, and widespread isolation of the battered spouse from the social connections that otherwise would be available to her. This is relevant in the economic sense, as well as obviously in the um, psychological sense, because it is through these social connections that most people get jobs. It's through these social connections that most people learn of opportunities, places where people are hiring, uh, areas that people are hiring. It's through your connections with the community that you orient yourself in a job market, job seeking situation or in a seeking of government benefits as well. Even Avon selling requires that you have some connection with your neighborhood, your friends, your workmates, whoever might be your potential market. So the economic nexus is obviously quite dependent upon the social nexus, and this is an area in which the battered spouse has suffered a serious, serious injury. The second aspect of the pathology that has particular relevance to the economic situation of the spouse is the low self-esteem that she has um, developed in this situation. The typical pattern of behaviors, interactions in a battering household is by the batterer a barrage of criticism alternating with charm, an expert manipulation. The message that is being given by this is you are good for nothing. You are incompetent. I will take care of you. You will derive your worth only through me. I have the right to control you. You deserve discipline. You deserve my anger. Those are the messages that are developed in the battering situation. Obviously, those messages and that intimacy and that isolation have a devastating effect upon the self-esteem of the battered spouse. The economic relevance of this again, in addition to the devastating psychological relevance. The economic relevance is that it impairs enormously one's confidence for seeking jobs, for seeing oneself as an actor in the job market, for seeking interviews, for dealing with the inevitable rejections in, in a job-seeking situations. Another aspect of this is the effect that this low self-esteem has upon the physical appearance and demeanor of the battered spouse. A very common characteristic of battered spouses is they're significantly overweight. They have neglected many of their self-care aspects, nails, hair, whatever. They have few clothes, and the clothing that they have tends to be more durable and serviceable rather than with a view toward public presentation. This is one of the aspects of the injury. They have a lack of confidence in their parents. All of this, of course, is extremely relevant to the job-seeking situation and the job-maintaining situation. Why is the job-maintaining situation so important? Well, the statistics show that every divorced woman depends primarily for her income on jobs. Not, not every divorce, sorry. Most, sorry, the primary source of support for women who are divorced is jobs. And that means that almost every divorced woman has to look primarily to the job market for her support now. But the job outlook is not particularly great for women in general, and particularly not great for the battered spouse. One of the aspects of the job market that I've been studying in connection with the um, uh, project that I've been doing on economic measures and mechanisms in women's lives are the relative opportunities for women, uh, first in terms of money. The average woman will get perhaps one half of what the man gets. The figures vary from 32 percent to 66 percent depending upon the particular job ghetto in which she finds herself. These women, I'm sure the battered spouses would be in the 32 percent range rather than in the 66 percent range. They're not young, childless, professional women of upper classes who have had a golden record and have a total amount of uh, physical presence 
and um, success experience. One of the ways that these women can be assisted in developing skills for the job market is to work for a longer training period, a longer skills building period. Firstly, just the length of time away from the battering situation will improve the um, outlook, the psychology of the battered woman. Secondly, this gives more opportunity for formal psychological treatment. And thirdly, a higher skill level will give a person more confidence. So rather than push a woman in this situation directly into the job market saying you'll feel much better when you're bringing home a paycheck, even if it is for $92 a week, push for job training and push for vocational counseling to get job training that is relevant to skills and interests and aptitudes. Jerry is going to talk a bit about the amount of support. Uh, in general, as you probably know, the percentage of support payments that the um, male is required to plot, pay is usually a relatively small percentage of the uh, take-home pay and has very limited duration. As the statistics show, most men after divorce experience a real increase in their standard of living from 5% to about 17% immediately, that is within six months after the divorce or the separation. Most women experience a real decrease on the order of 40 to 50% in their standard of living. Typically this is because the paycheck has to be spread around. She gets much less than um, a 50% share. The typical rate is somewhere around 20% of the paycheck share. And she has to use that paycheck share plus her other resources to cover not only her own expenses, plus her job reentry expenses, which can be considerable clothes, training, et cetera, commuting, but also childcare and support of children. The um, tax aspects of child support being an old tax person are also something that should not be neglected. Uh, currently, tax um, will apply to all payments received by way of support, either uh, direct support of the spouse herself or of the children. Um, and this, especially of the children, becomes critical in tax planning. Therefore, in negotiating settlements, be aware of the tax burdens. They hit fairly quickly and they are very heavy. Do a calculation of what they are so that at least you know what the tax impact will be. I have um, a record of a young woman who was going through a divorce situation with four children. She was awarded something like uh, $4,000 a year in child support, which was actually paid. She was lucky. She owed on that, uh, sorry, she, she was awarded 10,000 of child support, which was actually paid, almost $1,000 a month. She herself earned 12,500 over the year. The 10,000 added on to it. The additional 10,000 created a $4,000 tax liability on her particular economic facts with her deductions. She owed 40% of that support payment in taxes. And that's a big chunk. It ate up her entire child tax credit. It ate up the whole credit that she had built up through the withholding from her own wages. And she had to pay, in addition to those, $1,000 to the uh, revenue authorities to cover the $4,000 tax liability. And this was on an income of $12,500 from a job and $10,000 of support payments. Well, another way of looking to the Batter, batterer for support is to look um, for third-party enforcement. Now, at this point, as far as I understand in Ontario, there's very little third-party enforcement of support orders, although there is uh, an office that will assist with that, but there's not a regular place where a woman can just go and get her money and have somebody else then take care of the collections and the risks of collections. Um, in a few countries, there is this advancement program. Um, however, one rather enterprising shelter in Pennsylvania has used the old thing that you may recall from contracts about how merchants uh, can uh, recover for credit extended for necessaries for dependents. Uh, the shelter sued the husband for, having ex for the cost of having extended necessaries to the wife and children and recovered. So third party enforcement is a promising area, but not one that um, has been pursued at, at this date 
in this, in this jurisdiction to any, with any great uh, amount of, of energy. The, what can the state do? If we can't look to the husband for support, we have two other aspects, the state and the private job market. What can the state do? Firstly, the state can do a lot with respect to housing. Uh, housing is going to be perhaps the, most, the single most critical economic dimension of the woman's life, seeking housing for her and for her children in a place where the, job, uh, where the uh, housing uh, vacancy rate is, is uh, very, very small. The affordability is very, very low. One of the aspects of seeking housing is your status as you go into the public agency and charged, uh, charged with uh, providing housing for people in need. If you are homeless, if you are in a temporary shelter, uh, like a shelter for battered women where you know that you have to leave within a certain amount of time, you're probably in a better situation for obtaining state assistance than if you have a home with a friend or a relative, even though that may be equally temporary, it's not so formalized as a temporary thing. Um, so uh, public shelters have the advantage of giving you this status as a fairly homeless person and seeking government assistance, state assistance, uh, for housing. Uh, shelters also provide safety and solidarity with other people and other women in the same situation. The shelter movement has been, of course, very important in this area. With respect to other areas of, of uh, uh, family assistance. Uh, we have the family benefit allowance and the general welfare allowance, a number of training allowances, and so forth. Um, as the new report from the Social Assistance Review Board uh, criticizes, there are somewhat, does something like 36 categories that people may be classified in as they go in for some form of public assistance. Um, to the extent that you are an advocate in this situation, you want to seek categories that allow for a lot of retraining because that is the critical need for women in this position is training, skills building, confidence building, training. Not situations where it is uh, a sort of a permanent uh, situation but permanent, and not situations that are very short term, but the characterization, the categorization that will give a fairly long term support but a training component as well. Student aid is another source of support in this area. Uh, if the woman uh, qualifies and is interested in going back for a, a formal degree, a, an associate degree or a bachelor's degree or professional training of some sort, then student aid may be available to assist her during the training period, regular student aid. This may be a more comfortable way of accepting assistance from the state than direct benefits uh, from, through the family benefits program, but everything should be, every tree should be shaken in the words of, I think, an earlier program in this series. One area in which there is some uh, promise, uh, but it has not yet materialized to any great degree, is the uh, compensation through the criminal injuries compensation boards. The difficulties here, of course, are uh, the nature of the injuries. The injuries themselves have to be proved, and when they are internal, when they are psychological, this is difficult. The damages consequent on those energy, uh, injuries have to be proved, and if this is, in, is impaired job market access, uh, that's also very difficult to prove. Um, and the formal requirements, the criminal complaint, the promptness of the complaint, the uh, whole process with respect to recovery under criminal injuries compensation. The um, government itself, however, has recommended that this is an area for women to consider. Um, where is my little magical sheet here? Great things to bring to bear upon this situation. It will be in the handout then. Anyhow, the government has said, uh, and it asked for its response to the situation of battered women in a conference a couple of years ago, that the criminal injuries compensation route would be one thing that it's going to investigate and try to make more available. However, aside from the spouse, aside from the state, the area where women will most commonly look for support will be the private economy, the private market. And here we have the usual list of what can women do, where can women get some money. The first preference, of course, is a job, a real job, a job that pays even if it's only 32 percent of a male wage. For that job, typically she will need some training because of the uh, situation as we've discussed. Her work history will be 
a problem. She will probably have worked less, or if she has worked, she is, will not have been able to concentrate on the job to build a professional uh, or a business context relationship in the way that a person who has not had the same pressures has been able to. There may have been gaps in her work history, either uh, years in which she was at home or days in which she was too injured or too battered looking to go to work. She will need some flexibility, if, especially if she has children. More flexibility than is typical in the usual work situation. Child care needs, of course, are constant here. She may seek part-time work because of the flexibility, but that's even lower paid and still needs some flexibility. And then there's the issue of combining part-time work with family benefits programs issued by the state. How much can you earn and still get benefits? Where does the uh, payback come in, the, the very significant offset <clears throat> of state benefits for private benefits? Again, the uh, Social Assistance Review Board uh, report that has just come out, or Social Assistance Review that has just come out, recommends that a lot be done in this area with respect to people who are at the low end of the income scale but working, working poor. Some of the areas that are not quite so traditional for women to think of as they're looking in this and things that are maybe somewhat compatible with further training are work that does not involve going out on the formal job market for a nine to five job or a part-time uh, regular hours job. These include providing childcare itself. This is a traditional area that women have done. Um, obviously, there are legal restrictions upon how many children one can take care of, on the kind of training you need to take, take upon the kind of space that you take care of children in. But babysitting, the low paid, low self-esteem, uh, low rated babysitting is still out there and is a source of cash. This is, there's a terrible need for people to provide that kind of service and that is an area where uh, people who have been through the battering situation do still feel some competence typically. Taking in lodgers, if you have shelter, if somehow you've managed to get a house or some kind of shelter, then taking in lodgers is another source of cash income. Again, there's space problems and legal restrictions and perhaps hassles over the standard of lodging. One market for taking in lodgers that is somewhat less problematic than others are student lodgers for term times. Then at least you have some respite from when they are there and the students um, typically don't have the, the kinds of problems that other lodgers might present with respect to the household interactions. Another kind of lodger to consider would, would be another woman with children, another person in the same situation, sharing lodging. This also has immediate cash advantages. Again, look at the effect here upon benefits that you may be entitled to from other government programs and especially on housing, and I expect this also would feed into the support uh, entitlements as well. Another area, non-traditional area, is agriculture. If you have space, your own garden, chickens, dairy goats, cows. If you're in a rural area working on farms during harvest seasons and uh, special cultivation jobs. Um, one of the jobs when I was a child was suckering tobacco. Uh, this was one of the most terrible jobs in the world. Tobacco is very toxic and you get sick after working all day in the tobacco fields. Suckers are these little extra shoots that come off and sap the energy from the plants. And to sucker tobacco, you go in the tobacco field and pinch them off. You do this about halfway through the cultivation process. And this was a job. This was a job that kids could do. This is a job that anybody can do. It's a terrible job, like most agricultural labor, but it does pay cash. Then there's the uh, equally low-rated home-based money-earning work. Um, this can cost you space and time, conflict with your own child care responsibilities, and is also very low paid. However, it is one place that you can use skills such as word processing or typing or sewing. One area that has been growing for women is the provision of formalized cleaning services. Again, as more and more women are out in the paid labor market, uh, they are requiring more and more assistance with their home-based responsibilities such as cleaning. And cleaning services are an area where women have found uh, sort of a guerrilla a market for their own uh, skills and expertise and flexibility of schedule. Uh, they can uh, get fairly good pay um, for fairly pleasant work because you can pretty well dictate the terms um, and if you're competent and responsible and you have some flexibility with respect to your child care provision needs. So those are the things that I had in mind in connection with the economic status of women in this situation. Um, Jerry, I think, has uh, some very specific things with respect to legal obligation and support to speak to you about. Thank you. I'm, I'm to tell you first 
that uh, the building's not burning down. They're uh, retarring the roof, and so what you're smelling is the work that's going on above us, so we don't have to evacuate. Um, as I was preparing for this program today, I was reminded of uh, one of the principles of physics, which is uh, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And as I considered the changes in the law over the 12 years in which I've been practicing, and in particular, the laws in relation to spousal support and the laws in relation to property, it became very clear to me that every time women move forwards in relation to the division of assets in the marriage, that they move backwards in relation to the acquisition of their entitlement to spousal support. And it, if you actually think about it, it it's almost, they almost go in a parallel line. Twelve years ago, when I started practicing law, that tells you how old I am, uh, women expected to get spousal support at the end of a marriage. And not only did they expect to get spousal support at the end of a marriage, but remember this, guys? They were entitled to have spousal support at a level that maintained the standard of living to which they had grown accustomed during the marital relationship. How many of you remember that? <laughs> sort of vaguely in the back of your minds in the old days, where you could actually present a budget that said, well, this is the standard of living we enjoyed when we were married, and this is the standard of living we're entitled to enjoy now that we're separated. And let's compare that to the pos position women find themselves in today, where a woman whose husband makes well over $100,000 or in the $100,000 range, if she can find a job making eighteen to twenty-five thousand dollars, some judge someplace is going to tell her that she's economically self-sufficient and she's not entitled to support. So we have really moved forwards on the one hand in certain respects and backwards on the other. Now let me digress for a moment because, because we're here to talk about domestic violence, I want to um, take advantage of the unusual opportunity I have of being able to address an audience in a completely sexually biased way. <laughs> I don't have to apologize for that here, uh, which is quite unusual. So what I'm going to talk about when I talk about spousal support is the impact and issue of spousal support and the developments in the current law, and particularly the trilogy of cases, as they've come to be called, um, on women. And. I'm going to look at it in light of the fact that we've now had a little more than two and a half years since the Family Law Act became law, and a little more than a year since the trilogy of cases and the decisions were released by the Supreme Court of Canada. And I should also tell you in passing that I noted with interest that it really seemed only to be in September of 1988 that the corporate world caught up with the Family Law Act. I was fascinated to discover that in the report on business in the Globe and Mail last week or the week before, there was a whole big article about um, the Family Law Act and Division of Assets in the corporate, uh, the corporate world. And I guess it took the Montague Black case for um, the rich and famous to figure out that if they left their wives, they're going to have to give them big bucks. And it was very interesting. Um, but having said all of that, um, and having said, yes, indeed, the Division of Assets in the Family Law, under the Family Law Act, is going to certainly impact advantageously to the Mrs. Blacks of, of the world, I would also like to remind you that for the vast majority of women, the Family Law Act actually has meant very little difference in terms of asset division. For the vast majority of women and the vast majority of families, the single greatest asset that the family has continues to be the matrimonial home. Uh, women have, to some extent, uh, gained some access to pensions, but the laws about pensions are so bizarre and unclear at this point that it's really, in many cases, difficult to figure out what women are actually going to get, particularly if they're deferring their pension entitlement to some time down to, to retirement. So that a woman who separates from her husband when she's 38 or 40, and her husband, you know, in the same age, age range, I. I'm really wondering if 25 years from now we're not all buying into a lot of negligence lawsuits rather than actual pension entitlement for these women. And so I'm not convinced that that has presented a huge economic gain for women. And in terms of women taking their pension entitlement as lump sums, if you have a 40-year-old woman and man, by the time you present value that to take into account the fact that the recipient spouse isn't going to receive that for another 25 years, in many instances, I think you will find that the values of those pensions are not significant. So I come back to saying that for the vast majority of women, 
notwithstanding the mythology. Uh, the Family Law Act has not really changed their uh, position significantly in terms of the division of assets. And for the vast majority of women, we are still leaving out the single largest asset, which is the man's ability to earn an income. And that is particularly important because the mythology of the Family Law Act has been that now that women are actually receiving their one half of the assets, that the issue of spousal support has become less crucial. And that simply is not the case. That's straight mythology. The second mythology, of course, is that um, the women's movement has made a significant impact on society and that women don't need support in the ways that they did before because we are now all out there working and because we are now all earning the same wages as men, or if we're not earning the same wages as men, we're not doing so because we're choosing not to do so and not because we couldn't if we wanted to. And as a long-standing feminist, I suppose I take some distress in the fact that though the, the women's movement has now been sort of taken into the male mythology and used as a weapon against women in terms of their ability to acquire spousal support at the other end of marriage. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, the women's movement has not made some changes, but I know, and I know that the statistics bear out, that women have not made significant economic gains in the last 20 years, the women's movement notwithstanding, that we still earn, as Sarah just said, between 32 and 66 cent dollars on the labor force, that we still, in most instances, absent ourselves from the labor force for significant periods of time to assume responsibility for child rearing, and that we, in most instances, also still see our jobs, even when we work, as secondary sources of income and not the primary source of income for the family. So that we tend not to take advantage of a lot of the career opportunities, even when we continue to work, that we might have taken advantage of if we had seen our job as the primary economic uh, source for ourselves or for our families. And therefore, what we have allowed to happen is the court to accept the mythology that the women's movement has made a significant difference in terms of women's uh, economic abilities. And we have not really countered that in our litigation with hard fact. And I find that particularly concerning when we start to address the issues of the causal connection um, notion which is developing in the law in terms of women's entitlement to spousal support. And I think we have to look at that very critically. And we have to reevaluate how we're going to litigate our cases in terms of women's entitlement to spousal support by addressing real economic realities and putting those before the court over and over and over and over again. We have to keep telling the court that the belief that women are able to be equal to men and to be economically self-sufficient is mythology. And we have to remind them that notwithstanding the women's movement and notwithstanding the rhetoric, for the vast majority of women, the fundamental marriage contract, not the vast majority of women, the vast majority of people, the fundamental marriage contract remains sexual fidelity <laughs> for support. Now, you know, when I used to lecture years ago and before, I don't even know that any of you but me and maybe Alan Ingram will remember the Deserted Wives and Children's Maintenance Act, <laughs> right? I used to actually be able to get up and say to people, the traditional marriage contract is the woman promises to be sexually faithful and the man in exchange promises to support her. Now that traditional marriage contract goes back to feudal England. It goes back to Henry II in the common law. Uh, and it certainly was with us as recently as 1967, 1968. It was with us as recently as 1978 when the first Family Law Reform Act uh, replace the uh, old Deserted Wives and Children's Maintenance Act, when a woman could be disentitled for spousal support under provincial legislation if, the husband could if she could not establish that she left the marriage because her husband had treated her in such a way as to be deemed to have constructively deserted her. Now, I know most of you don't remember that, but I'm reminding you of that to remind you that although the law has moved forwards and taken out those impediments, the reality for men and women who get married is that that still is the marriage contract. The vast majority of women still enter into marriage with the idea that their husbands are going to be the primary economic mainstay of the family and that they are going to be supported for the rest of their lives. And we can put all the rhetoric we want around all of that and we can address all kinds of, of statistics and whatever about women in the labor force, but the bottom line, if you ask most women who are getting married what they expect to happen is that traditional marriage contract. And I suppose that we are all hopefully working towards seeing that leave us, but that is where and how most people, most men and most women still view the marriage. 
and that marriage contract is reflected in the decisions that people make when they get married and how they organize and run their marital life. And it is very interesting to me that what has happened now is that there's a fundamental rewriting of that marriage contract after the fact. That for, in many, many cases, the woman will have been home with the children as a primary caretaker, um, housekeeper, or spouse, and she'll come into your office, the parties will have separated, and the first thing the, male, the, the husband's lawyer will say to you is, she's 38 years old, I know she's been home with those kids for 12 years, uh, but now she's supposed to go out and get a job. Right. Now, for the 12 years that uh, she was home looking after the children during the marriage, the contract between that man and that woman was that he was going to be the primary wage earner and she was going to provide the child care and household responsibilities. Now, it wasn't as if he, they got up every morning and he said, look at you lazy person, go out and get a job, <laughs> right? Uh, I'll come home and look after the children at 5 o'clock. And she said, I won't work, I won't work, I won't work, I don't care what you say. I mean, that's not what happens. <laughs> What happens is that they both agree that this is how they want their marriage to run. And they both, in their own way, during the currency of the marriage, benefit from the fact that the marriage is running that way. He, in terms of his ability to proceed with his career and not to have to be home to pick up child care responsibilities and to know that the, his children are being cared for by their mother and that she's there when they come home from school to give them lunch and whatever all of those issues are for people. But the minute the marriage is over, he's saying, well, that's tough. I want her to work. And the reality of that contract it, it ceases to be important. There's a new contract that's written. And the, whole, the question then is, if that's going to be the case, and indeed it appears that that's going to be the case, how do we compensate, in very basic terms, the woman who has lived, at, who has been at home for a certain period of time, how do we compensate her? How do we get her back, compensate her in damages, so to speak, for the fact that there has any effect been a breach of contract. Now I know that's a very, I mean, I'm not saying it's a unilateral breach in the sense that the marital breakdown may not be exclusively the man's fault, but the bottom line is the rules have changed in midstream for that family and one person is bearing the brunt of that change. It is not being shared equally. Now back to my written remarks. <laughs> um, I want to look for a moment at um, the decisions that came out in June the 4th of 1987, Karen, Richardson, and Pellick. And it, I really believe at this point that June the 4th, 1987 will become as important a uh, day for women um, as March 31st, 1986 was. In these three cases, the Supreme Court of Canada reviewed the law of spousal support, at least insofar as it relates to the power of the court to vary the terms of an agreement concerning spousal support in the face of what must be considered drastic changes in circumstances. Now, it's interesting, you know, we started, remember Farquhar and Webb, and we had now developed a line of cases that said that these contracts could be varied if the change was catastrophic. Well, we're moving, these three cases took us down one more step. They've taken, they've taken us down to the end of that, that line, down the, to the end of that slippery slope. Um, Let's look at these three cases for a moment, just in terms of their facts. I assume most of you know them, and you'll bear with me while I review them for those people who may not. Um, in Caron and Caron, the parties separated after 14 years of marriage. They had entered into a separation agreement which provided for spousal support with a provision that the same would terminate if the wife cohabited with another man, and she did, and the support terminated at some point thereafter. The second relationship ended. Mrs. Caron was now 41 years of age. She was self-supporting and she was also supporting, she was 41 years of age, she was not receiving any spousal support. She had the care and primary responsibility for the family's 14-year-old daughter and she was receiving welfare assistance. And Mr. Caron had substantial assets and was well able to contribute to Mrs. Caron's support. And in that case, the court said no, that she had signed this agreement, it had this clause and that she was therefore out of luck. Uh, in Richardson and Richardson, the parties had been married for 12 years and they had one child who was about five at the date of the separation. Mrs. Richardson had been out of the labor force for the five years since that child was born with a brief, one brief period of employment at the time. Mrs. Richardson, at the time the party separated, was receiving, yeah, yeah it was receiving um, a family allowance. She uh, overly optimistically anticipated that she would be able to become self within one year, signed an agreement that limited her support to one year, 
and at the end of that year, <laughs> to no one's surprise perhaps but hers, she wasn't self-sufficient and she was still on welfare. And she, now what's interesting in that case is she provided, she applied for support in the divorce proceedings. Now, um, I gather that the agreement, the separation agreement was not minutes of settlement in the divorce. The divorce then came up and she assumed as most of us had that the court retained its right to review agreements at the time of the divorce um, and to review the issue of spousal support and the Supreme Court of Canada said no, um, that she was not entitled to support and the court should intervene in a private settlement only if there had been a drastic change in circumstances since the signing of the minutes of settlement and that the change is the result of a pattern of economic dependency generated by the marital relationship. Now, interestingly enough, the fact that Mrs. Richardson had been out of the labor force for five years in order to assume responsibility for the raising of the party's child was not found to be a pattern of economic dependency generated by the marital relationship, nor was the fact that she continued to have the primary responsibility for the care of a young child as a sole support parent. So one wonders whether or not the problem was that um, the court did not consider those to be causally connected to the marriage, which I find fascinating if they did not, or whether there simply was an evidence led at the time to suggest that her economic dependency was in fact a result of these issues which were indeed causally connected. Now for our purposes, the case that is most interesting is Pellick and Pellick. Fascinating case when you actually sit down and look at it carefully, especially for the purposes of our discussion today around women who are victims of violence. In that case, the parties had been married for 15 years and they separated in 1969. Now there was a trial. Now this was out in a different province and so I gather their procedures were a little different because there was a trial. And at the trial, there were two things that were interesting. Firstly, the judge found that Mrs. Pellick had serious emotional problems. And based on that, they awarded custody to Mr. Pellick. Now bear in mind, this is 1969. So I'm forced to conclude that given the fact that women rarely lost custody in 1969, uh, I'm forced to conclude that her emotional problems must have been quite serious. Um, they also, the judge also decided that Mrs. Pellick was entitled to ongoing spousal support and in that case he referred the question of the amount to the registrar to um, assist in resolution and report back to the court. Now that's not a process that we have in Ontario. But then this is where it becomes interesting. Here's a woman who has serious emotional problems and who, where a judge has already made a finding that she's entitled to ongoing spousal support. So they go off to negotiate and to do this with the registrar and what happens is this woman signs an agreement limiting her entitlement to spousal support to a little over $28,000 to be paid over 13 months. Now, the registrar accepts that agreement. I don't know why, because the court already said that she was entitled to ongoing spousal support, and that seems to be the end of it, except that Mrs. Pellick, notwithstanding her very, what appear to be very reasonable efforts to maintain herself in terms of working and investing her money, um, is unable to do so. Her health deteriorates both physically and emotionally and she's unable to ultimately to work and is on welfare. Now, what's very interesting to me is that it was her assertion apparently at trial that her emotional problems stem from physical cruelty by her husband during the marriage. The court rejected this finding and in fact found that Mrs. Pellick's psychological problems and not Mr. Pellick's conduct towards her contributed to the marital breakdown. The judge also found that uh, she had, by signing this agreement to accept $28,760 over 13 months, uh, that agreement was not unconscionable, even though the trial judge in the first instance had ordered her to order lifelong support. So now we're left to wonder why Mrs. Pellick was asserting that there had been physical cruelty in the marriage, if indeed there was not, what caused Mrs. Pellick's emotional problems, and if indeed there had been, if there had been no physical cruelty in the marriage, why Mrs. Pellick would have accepted $28,000 in full satisfaction of what the judge already found that she was entitled to, presumably in part because of her emotional problems being lifelong support. We're left wondering why the judge did not consider the fact that the original trial judge found that Mrs. Pellick had emotional problems of such severity that the trial judge awarded custody of the children to Mr. Pellick, which was a very unusual thing to do in 1969. So here's a woman who in 1969 had very serious emotional problems, who had been entitled in the first instance to lifelong support, 
who waived that right for some reason which we don't understand for what strikes me as a very small sum of money even in 1969 terms, who makes valiant efforts to manage on her own, who comes back to the court and says, I signed that agreement, probably said, I signed that agreement in 1969 because I had serious emotional problems and I was terrified of my husband and those were a result of the physical abuse. And now, of course, Mr. Pellick is well able to assist in her support financially and the court says that she's not entitled. The basic premise which underlines these three cases is, to quote Madam Justice Wilson, it seems to me that where parties have negotiated their own agreement freely and on the advice of independent legal counsel as to how their financial affairs should be settled on the breakdown of their marriage, and the agreement is not unconscionable in the substantive law sense, it should be respected. People should be encouraged to take responsibility for their own lives and their own decisions. This should be the overriding policy consideration. Those are very important words when you think about the realities for spouses and especially women who are victims of violence um, at the end of their marriages. And then she says at page 268, it seems to me that it goes against the mainstream of recent authority, both legislative and judicial, which emphasizes mediation, conciliation, and negotiation as the appropriate means of settling the affairs of the spouses when the marriage is dissolved. This is, again, we're now sort of taking the final step here in the process of elevating private agreements in family law, which started with Farquhar in 1983 and Webb thereafter. So now, according to the Supreme Court of Canada, in order for the court to vary a private agreement, the question is no longer whether the change in circumstances is catastrophic, but whether it is both catastrophic and causally connected to the marital relationship. Now, What's going to be interesting is what's going to be seen as causally connected to the marital relationship. And I note in that regard that there's a case, a recent Manitoba Queen's Bench case, Berner and Berner. Mr. Justice, Bar Justice Barkman ordered paragraphs in the wife's affidavit referring to physical abuse by her husband during the marriage and her fear of him at the time she signed minutes of settlement struck because they referred to fault during the marriage, which under the Divorce Act is not a proper consideration by the court when determining the issue of support. So <laughs> on the one hand side, we're told that we have to have a causal connection, and the other hand side, we're told that when we try and establish the causal connection, since conduct is not an issue in determining quantum of support in divorce, that we can't bring those issues before the court. So <laughs> I wonder where we go in terms of walking this little circle. Now, in that case, Mrs. Berner had signed minutes of settlement in which she had accepted child support and spousal support of $1. And in her application to vary the amount of support, she alleged that she had signed those minutes because her husband had threatened her and because of her fear of her husband. Now, certainly in many cases in our experience, those are not unusual considerations. Um, and it's also, of course, given our experience, fair to assume that given the impact of spells of violence that Mrs. Berner's ability to become self-sufficient will be materially affected by the spousal abuse during the relationship. So we're left with this ironic situation where the cause of her economic dependence may not be relevant in the first instance in a divorce, since conduct is not a criteria in determining support, but it may also be that given the requirements of causal connection to the change of circumstances required by Ms. Madam Justice Wilson and, Wilson and Pellick, that while it won't be an issue in first instance, it may well be an issue in an application to vary. So are we establishing two different standards here in these two different situations? And I'm left to ask also if, as poor Mrs. Pellick did, if you don't put your evidence in about the spousal abuse and the cause, impact of all of those in the first instance, how much difficulty are you going to have proving them or raising them if you try and put them in in the second instance when you're bringing your application to vary? Now, these while well, the trilogy of cases, as they have come to be called, clearly deal only with situations in which the spouses have signed a private agreement the concept of requiring the economic dependency to be causally connected to the marital relationship has begun to be incorporated into the law of support generally. 
In several reported cases, for example, Winterly uh, and Winterly, and I'll get, quote you, Salhaney, who was sitting as a local judge of the Supreme Court, stated in that case, and this is interesting because he says it and he doesn't say it, so listen to exactly what he says. I agree that the criteria to be applied on an application for support under Section 15 is different from that where a spouse seeks to disturb the provisions of a separation agreement. So he's starting by saying, yes, those trilogy of cases require an application to vary. However, he goes on to say, I think it is significant that each of the enumerated purposes set out in subsection 7 is directed toward equalizing economic advantages or disadvantages or relieving economic hardship because of the nature of the marital relationship. Running through the trilogy of cases is the theme that marriage itself does not create an entitlement to support, which I suggest goes against the preamble of the Family Law Act, which says that marriage is an economic partnership, however. It is the economic hardship which has been created because of the marriage relationship that creates entitlement. Moreover, support should be directed towards promoting economic self-sufficiency for the disadvantaged spouse insofar as it can be achieved. If society is to recognize that almost one half of marriages today fail, this is Salhaney, then it is in the public interest that economic ties after separation be severed as soon as it is practically possible so that the parties can get on with their lives. However, as Wilson Jay observed in the passage quoted earlier in the Pellet case, the obligation to support the former spouse should be, as in the case of any other citizen, the communal responsibility of the state. So what they're saying, in effect, at this point is that the marital relationship itself does not create economic dependency, that as a public policy consideration, given the numbers of divorces, we should terminate spousal support <clears throat> as soon as practically possible, that the purpose of support should be directed toward promoting economic self-sufficiency for the disadvantaged spouse, we have completely lost any idea of maintaining a standard of living for her. That is now gone. And we should leave the responsibility of supporting the disadvantaged spouse on the state and not on the spouse who has, materially, who has benefited materially by the marriage during the marriage. So here we come welfare. Right? Let's not look to the spouse who has benefited materially from the marital relationship to assist this woman and this family, but let's look to the state to welfare. Now, on the other hand, there are cases which have taken a more restrictive view of the trilogy and have limited it, its applicability to cases in which agreements have been signed. And I refer you to example to the case of Medell, a decision of Judge King of the Provincial Court, in which he refers us again, <laughs> in, thank you, Lynn, to the criteria set out in Section 33 of the Family Law Act, which seem to have got lost in the corporate shuffle here. We've uh, long, we seem to have abandoned those and taken on this whole new standard. Now, until now, it has in many cases been necessary when acting for women who are victims of domestic violence to lead evidence as to the impact of the violence on the woman and its effect on her long-term ability to become economically self-sufficient. And to remind us what Sarah Salter has just said, there are lots of issues in terms of women's ability to become economically self-sufficient per se, but for women who are the victims of domestic violence, those issues are even more significant. It may now be necessary to lead evidence concerning the violence in order to establish that the woman's inability to become economically self-sufficient is causally related to the marriage. And moreover, while it is often difficult to prove the violence in the first instance, it would of course be even more difficult to prove the violence sometime later in an application to vary an agreement or minutes of settlement. Therefore, given the trilogy of cases and the necessity of establishing causal connection in order to succeed in an application to vary, it may well be inappropriate to have a client who is the victim of violence sign a separation agreement or minutes of settlement 
unless the agreement makes specific mention of the violence itself and the impact of the violence on the wife. In fact, the trilogy, which is based on the premise that private agreements not only, not, ought not only to be respected but to be encouraged, may have led to the ironic conclusion that in many cases, and especially in cases where the woman has been the victim of violence and faces a, an uncertain financial future, that she ought not to sign minutes of settlement or separation agreements. So what we may have done is just really thrown them out of the ballpark for many, many women, unless the husband is prepared to put in that agreement an acknowledgement of the violence and the statement that it will have future impact on the woman's ability to become economically self-sufficient. Because I dare say that 5, 10, 15 years down the road, you are going to have enormous difficulty reestablishing the violence. We know that, as I said, it's hard to prove it in many cases in the first instance because it happens privately without witnesses, often behind closed doors. Women are reluctant to go to the doctor. They're reluctant to tell people about it. They're reluctant to have the, the bruises documented. The husbands almost always deny it. It's not the easiest thing to prove in the first instance, except in cases where there's been real serious injury or repeated police involvement. And it may be virtually impossible to prove it 5, 10, 15 years later. And if the requirement is going to be, in terms of applications, to vary, that you're going to have to establish that causal connection, then you better be sure that you can prove it or that there's some, something at the front end of the case that you can hang your hat on later on or you're going to have real trouble. Sort of like after Farquhar, I remember I never used to put into minutes of settlement um, a material change of circumstances clause. I just assumed that once minutes of settlement were incorporated into a court order, it was a given that they could be varied in if there had been a material change of circumstances. And then Farquhar came along and all of a sudden that wasn't that clear anymore. It was like they looked at these minutes of settlement as a document unto itself and they forgot or didn't take into account that it really was a document that was to be incorporated into a court order and with the assumption that all of the underpinnings of a court order were then going to apply to it. So we then all had to start making sure that we included material change of circumstances clauses in our minutes of settlement or face the possibility that down the road they were going to say, well, you signed these minutes of settlement and it didn't say that there ought to be a, a variation in the event of material change in circumstances. Well, we're now going one next step because it, even if you say there ought to be a variation in the event of a material change of circumstances, if we look at what uh, these, this trilogy of cases does, it limits what constitutes a material change of circumstances. As we have discussed previously, the movement towards the reprivatization of family law by encouraging the signing of private agreements and the strong movements toward mediation was even before the trilogy a serious issue for women who have been the victims of spousal abuse. So we have talked in, in our previous gathering here two years ago and, and other situations, we have talked about the fact that there are a lot of issues for women in terms of mediation and um, separation agreements and signing minutes of settlement for women who are victims of violence. And I think that the consensus at this point is that mediation is not appropriate for women who are victims of spousal abuse. And we've also discussed previously a lot of issues around the fact that women who are victims of spousal abuse will sign inappropriate agreements out of fear will um, acquiesce to the demands of their spouses out of fear, even in the face of I or many other lawyers saying, this is a terrible agreement, you ought not to sign it. They will say, I'm afraid of him, I want this over with, I want to get on with my life, he's going to kill me if I litigate. There are all those issues for them uh, that make it much more difficult for them to take their litigation through to, to conclusion. Uh, and at one point I was discussing the possibility of having those agreements and minutes of settlement set aside using an argument of general coercion. that. Although her husband wasn't standing, you know, the traditional notion of coercion in setting aside contract law, that if he'd been standing there with a gun to her head uh, and she signed the agreement, you could have it set aside. Well, I was trying to develop this notion that if there had been a pattern in the relationship that made her so afraid of her husband that she signed the agreement, notwithstanding that there was specific coercion at that moment, that perhaps we could develop arguments that the agreements ought to be able to be set aside using this notion of general coercion. Now, I'm concerned that this elevation of private contracts that we see in the trilogy and this sort of sanctification and, and uh, of them as what we really want to happen is going to erode the possibilities of having minutes of settlement and private agreements set aside in those kinds of situations. So it makes me doubly cautious in terms of the kinds of issues that um, you have to consider. So the trilogy only reinforces all of these concerns 
And quite frankly, I submit that we face the prospect of numerous Mrs. Pellicks down the road. <coughs> With all due respect to the court, Wilson Jay, in giving such status to private contracts between spouses, assumes an equality of bargaining which in many cases simply is not present. It is interesting to note that in other areas of the law in which the lack of equality in bargaining is recognized, such as landlord and tenant law, employers and employees, consumers and producers, legislation has been passed which is designed to protect the less powerful spouse by establishing legislative controls on the scope of bargaining, such as provisions which cannot be contracted out of or by passing controlling legislation. For example, in the Landlord-Tenant Act, there's a recognition that individual tenants are not powerful in relation to landlords. So the residential tenancy portions of the Landlord-Tenant Act cannot be contracted out of by individual tenants. So even if your landlord gives you a lease which purports to contract out of the notice provisions in the Landlord-Tenant Act, that's void. The Act says specifically you can't contract out of that. There are numerous consumer protection legislation, pieces of legislation, because clearly I'm not, I can't bargain equally with General Motors. I can't even bargain equally with Ford. I mean, you know, I, I can't bargain equally with Loblaws. It, it's ridiculous to assume that there's equality of bargaining in those situations, and equally with employers and employees. So there is a myriad of legislation out there where there's a recognition of the lack of equality in bargaining which is, re, is remedial legislation and designed to protect the, the uh, less powerful party. Well, it's common knowledge, certainly, we know the, about the social and economic disadvantages of women in society. Anyone who says that there's equality of bargaining on balance between men and women it knows that that simply isn't true. I mean, they're, they're, they're stating the ridiculous. I mean, the, the, everybody recognizes that women are a disadvantaged group, or certainly ought to recognize that women are a disadvantaged group. Now, certainly there are individual situations where that's not true. And indeed, there may be individual situations where a landlord and a tenant have equality of bargaining, uh, and even in a residential tenancy situation. I mean, I posit, for example, the person who rents out their basement apartment to a tenant. There isn't that much difference in that situation. But you pass laws that address the social realities for the majority of people. You don't pass laws that address the social realities for one or two or three or even 10 or 100 special situations. The social reality for the majority of people in our community is that women do not bargain equally with their husbands, period. And yet, when we talk about contract law in this particular instance, there's no recognition of the lack of equality and we, we are not passing or we're not taking into account the fact that, that we are not, that women do not, especially women who are victims of domestic violence, are not in a position to bargain equally with their husbands. And this is, I submit, one of the few cases in which the law does not recognize specifically the lack of equality. Now, I'm also left wondering about Section 33.4 of the Family Law Act, which states, the court may set aside a provision for support or a waiver of the right to support in a domestic contract or paternity agreement and may determine and order support in an application under Section 10, although the contract or, application, contract or agreement contains an express provision excluding the application of this section. A, if the provisions for support or the waiver of the right to support results in unconscionable circumstances, and a man worth a million dollars and a woman on welfare must offend the conscience of most people, or B, if the provision for support is in favor of, or the waiver is by or on behalf of a dependent who qualifies for an allowance support for support out of public money. This section of the Act seems to directly contradict the provisions of Pellick, and one wonders if there's going to be a different standard under the Divorce Act than under the Family Law Act. And if it, this is indeed the case, then perhaps we ought to bring all our support applications under the provincial legislation. Because I don't know how, I can't, I can't imagine how we're going to reconcile that section of the provincial legislation with Pellick. I'd be interested if any of you have any thoughts on that subject, because they seem to directly contradict each other, as, as blatantly and as directly as possible. Because that section specifically says that the court can set aside, now it doesn't say the court must, but it says the court may set aside an, uh, an agreement 
if the dependent qualifies for an allowance for support out of public money. And quite frankly, the policy consideration that led to that particular section is in direct contradiction to what Salhani and, and Wilson Jay were saying in their reasons in those two decisions. Exactly opposite sides of the same coin. We also must look skeptically at the idea that the economic dislocation of the decisions which were made during marriage can be realistically evaluated or finally determined by an agreement at some moment in time proximate to the separation itself. The reality is that many women have not had to be financially independent during the marriage and they may have very little idea of the realities of surviving economically without the financial support of their spouse. This is particularly the, the, particularly the case for women who have, not, who have been out of the labour force or for women who have not been allowed to control the family finances and typically in cases of domestic abuse women are not allowed to control the family finances. I mean very few of them have the slightest idea about what anything costs. The women's movement notwithstanding, the current reality of the marital relationship remains within the ambit of the traditional marriage contract. The wife promises sexual faithfulness in exchange for economic support from the husband. The Family Law Act in fact reminds us in the preamble that marriage is an economic partnership and for the vast majority of women the terms of the partnership put the primary responsibility for family and child care on the woman and the major financial burden on the husband. To require each woman to establish that her economic condition is causally connected to the marriage is in my view to ask her to prove a given. There are some marriages in which this would not be the case but given that this is the exception rather than the rule one would expect the onus of establishing the lack of causal connection to fall on the husband who is seeking not to pay support and not on the woman who is seeking to get support. The notion as stated by Wilson Jay that we enter marriages as individuals and leave as individuals equally does not address the fact that the intervening period, being the period of the marital state, will impact on the individual spouses differently and the quality of the individual who leaves the marriage may be significantly different than the individual who entered the marriage. So in my view, to say that we start out as individuals and end as individuals completely does not take into account the fact that there's a period in between and that that period in between is going to impact on the quality of that individual person's life and persona, quite frankly, especially in the case of domestic violence, over the long term. That woman who leaves the marriage after living with a man who has been abusive for a number of years is not the same individual who entered into that marriage and somebody has to be responsible for that. It also fails to recognize the social realities which determine in large part our decision says individuals. In other words, it's tried in my mind to say we enter as individuals and leave as individuals. We do not each of us make decisions in space and time. We are all products of our society. The decisions that we make in terms of how we function within a marriage, the decisions that we make in terms of our, our participation in the labor force, the decisions we make about our lives and who will look after the children, et cetera, et cetera, we don't all sit down and start from square one when we're born and when we get married and say, well, dear, let's you and I talk about who's going to look after the children. These decisions are in large part dictated by the communal context in which we live. They are foregone conclusions for most of us and very few of us can deviate very far from that norm. And those of us who have struggled in feminism to try and create a more equality appreciate the extent to which it's difficult to deviate from that norm. I mean, on a personal level, my husband and I have tried very hard to establish equality of child rearing. Well, I'll tell you that that's a constant struggle in terms of myself being willing to give up responsibility to him to look, in terms of looking after the children. Not because I don't want him to, but because it's really hard to overcome a, a thousand generations of socialization. It's not easy to get up and say, okay, we're going to do this 50-50. I mean, 50-50 isn't born out of, out of space. I have a thousand years of, of, of history to unravel. We have to peel off the levels of the onion for all of us. So even saying that um, we each make decisions as individuals to me is simply not the case. These are issues for all women they are particularly issues for women who have been the victims of violence. The trilogy has only made our role as lawyers more important and our job more difficult. And I cannot caution you too much in terms of those kinds of realities at this point. I think we have to be tremendously concerned about what those cases may mean for, for women. And I think we have to really start, I mean, we're now fighting a rear guard action. We have to uh, start taking uh, Mr. McLeod or Professor McLeod on, on his own ground. 
Um, we've let men get away with this and far too long, and I think we have to start really getting up and saying, hey, judge, hey, court, let's look at the realities, the economic realities that women are facing at the other end of the marriage. We ought not to have to justify time and time again that the fact that a woman was out of the labor force for 5, 6, 10, 15 years is going to impact on her for the rest of her life. We ought not to have to go to court and argue that a woman who can make $25,000 after 15 or 10 years out of the labor force is economically self-sufficient when her husband is making 60, 70, 80. I mean, th those arguments ought not to be ones that we have to have case after case after case. But if we're going to have to have them, then let's have them and let's go there ready to fight them because we owe our women clients at least that much and we particularly owe our women clients who are victims of violence that much. Now, that's it. Now I'm to tell you <laughs> that there's a coffee break and then there's lunch, then we're going to have our workshops and lunch in the film and the, the second lecture will start at 1.30 p.m. I have seen the film. Um, I, asked, I urge you to come and see it. Uh, it's a very, very good film and what it does is it reminds us or it makes us look at again how difficult living in poverty and putting your life together as a woman who is a victim of violence really is. It's something that we don't think about when we see our clients in our offices and I urge you to come and watch that film. Thank you. Thank you. They're executed when they're carried out. Okay, Sergeant O'Halloran is going to have an opportunity to tell you a lot more about what his unit does that's relevant to you a bit later in the program as well as to answer your questions. But initially I just want to sketch out for you what we hope to do in the next hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes. In this workshop we want to address two major areas. One is the whole area of, which is rather amorphous, of strategy, the use of the rules, the use of particular sections of relevant statutes in representing your client who is the battered spouse in your, your typical family law application. And to give us a basis to, to talk about that, uh, that area, I've done a couple of things. One, I've drafted materials which are in the, the last part of your materials for the course today. Um, that are a notice of motion and a supporting affidavit and a notice of cross motion and a supporting affidavit from a woman who's alleging that she's a battered spouse and that that violence is relevant to a number of issues that come up in the motion and a husband who is denying it. And the, the issues that come up in the motion are ones that if you're not already quite familiar with you will be soon. Um, custody, access and the question of supervised access request that a child not be removed from the jurisdiction, um, request for ex interim exclusive possession of the matrimonial home, request for a restraining order. We've used those materials to do a mock motion for you that is going to be run quite shortly. Um, and in that motion, a couple of your colleagues are arguing before Master Cork the, the materials, the, the motion and the cross motion that are they're in your materials. Um, I ask you to, to bear with us throughout this, the, the hearing of this motion. I, I think it's useful to see because it's quite realistic in terms of what you will encounter on interim motions where spousal violence is an issue. It, um, I think true to form, the, the actual motion took over an hour to argue and we've edited it down to 20 minutes. But uh, it does, I think, illustrate some important points on the how important spousal violence might be and the type of evidence that you might need when you're arguing issues of custody and exclusive possession on an interim basis. Now after that videotape is run at the motion, I'll be asking Master Cork some specific questions that I, I hope will uh, be, and I hope his answers will be illuminating to you around the practice issues that, that come out of that motion, the materials and, and what you've seen on the videotape. I'll also make a few comments myself if we have time about rules that I think are not, are not frequently used in, in interim proceedings and how they might be used when you're representing a battered spouse. And then I want to turn to Sergeant O'Halloran um, in particular to talk about enforcement issues with respect to orders and judgments that you might obtain when you are representing a battered spouse and specifically orders, um, for example, that might direct the police to apprehend a child 
and return that child to the custodial spouse. Orders for exclusive possession and restraining orders. Um, we'll be exploring how, how the Metropolitan Toronto Police or other police forces and how the Sheriff's Office m might be helpful to you in getting those orders enforced. Please, this is supposed to be a, a workshop and I'm tr I'd like to encourage you to participate um, in what's going on today. So after we've won the videotape and we get into discussion, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions or make comments at any point in the proceeding because your input will, will make it a more interesting morning. Thanks. Can you run the videotape now? As a preliminary matter, Master, uh, if I could initially say that counsel, my friend, and I have agreed that we would treat this motion on an interim and term basis pending cross-examination and bring the matter of the motion and the cross-motion back before you in two weeks' time and have the transcripts expedited if necessary for that purpose. It will be necessary. And uh, we've also agreed that, and I'm willing to consent to an order requiring that all parties be subject to an assessment, not just the respondent. If I could just begin with the issue of custody and descending yeah. order. Yeah. Um, the children, once again, uh, I will try to restrict my comments to what the records do agree on, are currently in the care and control of the wife. Um, and basically we are asking that just for the next two weeks the status quo be left the way it is. Uh, the um, child of you know, three years old is still of tender years and should normally be with the mother in any event. We don't think it would be a good idea to separate the siblings at this stage. Even I won't without... separate the siblings as a matter of fundamental faith until I am forced to do so at the point of a gun. Go well, on from there. Appreciate that, Master. Uh, it would be very disruptive to uh, transfer the children for such a brief period of time to the respondent if in fact ultimately in the next after the next two weeks are over custody is to remain with the mother uh, we are as we mentioned earlier asking for an assessment of all the parties concerned uh, pending cross-examination we can begin the process of assessment uh, and given this willingness I, I really don't see how the respondent would be would be prejudiced for the status quo to remain where it is and as far as the issue of exclusive possession is concerned. Um, the Master is aware that it must be necessary, of course, to prove as a preliminary matter that it is impossible for the parties to continue living together, pursuant to various cases, including the case of Grieg and Grieg, Master's decision of 1980, and that uh, the materials certainly suggest on both sides that there is considerable strife, if nothing else, between these parties. Uh, and it would not be a good idea for them to continue living together at this stage. There are six factors that, Master, I believe you must consider under Section 24, from bracket 3 of the Family Law Act. Uh, if you do not do so, it is considered a reversible error, but I feel uh, we should briefly go through that. Let's let other people worry <laughs> yes. about that, shall we? Firstly, uh, it must be the best interest of the child must be considered. Uh, and one of the ways of testing that according to subsection 24 4b of the act is to ascertain the children's preference in these matters and of course we can't do that today and that's one of the things that hopefully the assessment will do the second factor uh, which doesn't pertain here is with respect to any existing orders which there aren't any in this matter the second the third item in the statute is respe with respect to the financial position of, of the spouses as I've indicated before um, it's been admitted in the record that um, the respondent works full-time and uh, earns $30,000 per year. Does not appear to have any other dependents or uh, major responsibilities. Uh, he has a mortgage which he's paying for $1,100 per month on the house. Um, I feel that the, uh, once again on the balance of, of convenience, it is very difficult for my client on unemployment insurance benefits at this time to afford to live 
anywhere else. And I, if she could have, she, she would have been able to uh, perhaps get better accommodation given her means. Uh, she has not been able to do so. What we've got here is a, a unit of four people, three children and a mother. And it's true that it, it may be difficult for this man to find alternate accommodation. Uh, but if we, if we look at the balance of convenience between these two sets of parties, surely the, the, just the numbers alone, uh, the children cannot continue to live uh, with this woman in a single room uh, at this shelter. And uh, if the... Is there any evidence before me that she has to leave? Or is it just a question of crowding? Is this there's, a great, there's a great deal of crowding. There's a tremendous demand on uh, shelters in general, on this one in specific, from what I understand, to, uh, uh, because there's a tremendous uh, lack of space. But there's no evidence that they, no. will, they were, are going to be turfed out into this. No, no. Forward. The final aspect in the statute uh, that you must consider involves the issue of violence. And the, rec the two records contradict each other greatly on this issue. Um, our client alleges violence committed against her uh, some time ago and continuing threats of violence currently, including threats to kill her and the children. These are very uh, serious allegations. Uh, and uh, the question we have to ask at this stage without cross-examination is just exactly who do you believe? Uh, I'd like well, to I point... I believe anybody at this Well, I, I would suggest one important discrepancy in the materials which perhaps could lend some credibility, more credibility to our client's material than my friend's. If you would care to look at um, page 7, um, paragraph 7 of page 3 of the applicant's affidavit, it mentions there that... Um, the injuries that she had suffered back two years ago. Two years ago, yes. And there she mentions that he punched and kicked me and I suffered bruises to my face and upper part of my body and broken rib. And attached to this affidavit is a copy of a report from a family doctor, Dr. Brown, confirming those injuries. Now, if we compare that to the affidavit of the respondent and his materials, He mentions only uh, on page four, paragraph nine, that during that incident, he tried to restrain uh, my client during some kind of a scuffle, that she broke away, fell, apparently breaking a rib. He mentions, and then he goes on to say that he feels that her injuries were self-inflicted. It's, a, I think, of some importance that he makes no reference whatsoever to the injuries on the face or on the upper part of the body. He has no explanation for how those happen. Mr. Surtex, yes. I sympathize with your predicament, but you must understand you are dealing with an incident that occurred two years or more Yes, ago. I agree. No charges were ever laid. No treatment by medical authorities was ever given that I'm aware of other than this medical report referred to. And the parties continue then to live in some type of armed neutrality or hard hostility, but nevertheless surviving, until they arrive on my doorstep now. The question is, how can we hold the fort until these people get the process done and get back here with some idea of what really are the facts of the situation? Well, Master, I agree it's difficult. However, if I could just conclude by saying that if we have to balance the rights of the parties in perhaps most every other type of legal situation, then the best course of action would be for the court to take uh, a very small role at this stage, if any position at all. However, given that uh, there are very serious allegations here, albeit they're, they're not cross-examinations, and there definitely appears to have been some violence in the history of this marriage, uh, on the balance of convenience alone at this stage, the, the problem that I face is that the prejudice to the respondent in your making such an order for exclusive possession or making an order for restraint at this stage, the prejudice to him is minimal compared to the possible effect of the court not taking any role at this stage. Because if in fact uh, we are wrong uh, and uh, the applicant is correct in her allegations and this man is violent, then uh, 
the, then she should be protected by some type of an order. And it's only for two weeks in any of it. I hope you're right on that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mr. Clark, what do you from your side of the call? I agree, Master, with your opening remarks that the two issues of the house and the children really are wrapped up in this together and that essentially who stays in the house or who gets in the house should also probably determine where the children should be for the time being. Uh, you realize, of course, that if the wife doesn't get back in the house, the husband is then faced with the absolutely terrible task of earning enough money to pay for their alternate housing someplace else. Not if we follow what you what you originally said, that the children should be in the house with either of the parents. What I'm proposing, of course, is that the children be returned to the house, which, which is their home, and and my client... Uh, Not on an interim, interim basis, I suspect. <laughs> Be that as it may, um, that is, of course, the, the solution to the dilemma uh, that my client proposes. We're talking about a short period of time. I share your concern that the uh, two-week estimate that we've given you now may not be realistic, but in any event, there is absolutely no suggestion in the material that the wife uh, and the children, for that matter, if you do not see fit to allow the children to uh, return to the home with my client. There's absolutely no suggestion that they can't stay where they are. They've been there for uh, about a month now, and no suggestion that they can't stay there for a further two-week period. There's also no suggestion that my client, the husband, has any other place to go to. My friend referred to the fact that if there was an order made by you today for exclusive possession, that that would be somehow minimal prejudice to the husband. Um, I would respectfully submit that any time an order is made for exclusive possession, which has the effect of ejecting either a husband or a wife from, the, from their castle, that that is not a matter to be taken lightly. It is not a matter of minimal prejudice. There are a number of very serious allegations made by the wife and her material, and I just want to very quickly highlight some of those. We hear the threat, as you no doubt see all too frequently, that the husband may leave the country with the children. If that was a realistic threat, he certainly could have, had, could have done so by now. He's had contact with the children at the school. You, He's, mean, you mean since the 21st or whenever it was? The first, the first, of, first April. of April. Yes. Well, would it help if I simply made a mutual order not his spouses to remove the kids from the jurisdiction? I have no... For their order written at the other spouse? No, that's no, probably no clear, to that. clear that up. Yeah. That's fine. Um, my client has, as well, is facing another number of allegations with respect to both his in mental instability and these um, supposed threats of violence. Um, we have a number of factors that I would submit that you could look at in terms of, of examining his conduct. He's retained counsel. He's gone to see the children at school. He hasn't seen fit, as he might have, to yank them out of school back to the matrimonial home. I get somewhat uncomfortable when I hear my friend talking about maintaining the status quo, meaning his client and the children in the shelter. That is a, a status quo achieved by a unilateral act of the wife. It is, I, I'm not sure what the shortest period of time that you've heard somebody rely on for status quo, but I would hope that a month should not uh, give any great weight to the concept of status quo. Surely... In the absence of any longer time, if you take what you can get. 
Well, surely the status quo for these the children... is whether I want to use it or not. <laughs> <laughs> that is perhaps the more important issue. Surely the status quo for the children is not in the hostel, it's in the house that the, the kids were living in in the past three years. And it's a question of, do they stay there with the husband or the, do they stay with, there with the wife? And that's, in my submission, the more serious issue. Um, we've had the husband working the early shift at his work. He's home by 3 o'clock in the afternoon every day. And for this three-year period when the wife has been working on a full-time basis, from 3 o'clock until 11 o'clock at night, well, and the kids are presumably all in bed before that time, then he's the primary caretaker for these children. Um, he can arrange for uh, and has indicated uh, in his material that uh, he has available to him arrangements for babysitting for the, for the baby, the two-year-old. Um, the other children for the bulk of the time are in school, and by the time uh, the children get out of school, he's at home to take care of them for the rest of the day. In my submission, that's far preferable to having um, them remain in the what is admittedly cramped conditions in the hostel. The, uh, with respect to the allegations of abuse, of abuse, Master, you've already pointed out that the incident relied on is approximately two and a half years old. No assault since then, although right in the material, the wife herself states she threatened at the time of that, supposedly, to lay charges. Notwithstanding all these allegations about uh, threats of various and sundry kind, no charges laid since then. Certainly, at least, at the very least, a threatening charge could have been laid by the wife. No charges have been laid. Uh, my friend commented on the, the, the discrepancy between the two affidavits. In my submission, the discrepancy is not as great as, as he would have you rely upon. I am perfectly content with the principle that there's any assistance to you that the spouses having chosen this course of action to stay apart will continue, and I'm not going to try to put them back together again. No, I'm certainly not su suggesting that. Um, I'm asking you to consider, however, whether the husband's version does have any ring of truth, whether you can possibly rely on his, his side of it, and in my submission you can't. It is, he has painted a, pic, a picture which in my submission is consistent. It's not unbelievable. It's not a matter where there are a number of documented assaults where uh, the husband is literally saying uh, she's just fabricated um, evidence of assaults. She's self, -inf she's inflicted injuries upon herself. Uh, it isn't like that. We have no supporting evidence from these babysitters of any misconduct on the part of the, the husband, such as uh, one might hope to have if any of these allegations were true. My submission is that the children should not be made to suffer any further, that they ought to be immediately permitted to return to the home. The husband is is, has made adequate arrangements. It will be very, diff very little different from the arrangements that the children have had for the past three years, and that in the interim, that's what should happen. Those are all of my submissions. Well, gentlemen, as I've said so often, I don't know any way of having parties separate that isn't a bloody god awful mess. Uh, it just seems to be one of the natures of the business and there's nothing I can do about it. I regret it has to be done in a difficult way, but I can't think of any other way but a difficult way to do it. All right. I effectively propose to do nothing, in one sense. This is an interim interim application. We don't know what the real set of the circumstances is. We have parameters of our, for argument's sake, but we don't have any fine, determined fact upon which we can rely. I don't propose to move the children back and forth unnecessarily. 
they have already suffered the turmoil of coming with the wife to the hostel and living in the hostel for this length of time. That's regrettable but unavoidable from my viewpoint. Certainly now I can't take them away from the mother and take them back and put them in the home with the father with some kind of a surrogate caring for them. I'm not going to move the children back and forth at this point. They're with their mother, have been for a month, and I think it would be very, very difficult to put them back in the matrimonial home with the father now, and also then possibly later on move them back out again. I'm not going to do that. As far as the possession of the, of the home is concerned, I think the wife's last argument is probably the right one in the sense that I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything about that now. I don't have the evidence. And again, I'm not going to have the father start to move out the mother's out, rightly or wrongly, she's created the situation, and I'll respect her for it. So on that basis, fine, let's get on with this lawsuit and find out what the facts are, and then we'll work on the basis of that. This is not that smoking chair leg type of situation where the children, uh, sorry, the wife grabs the children in the middle of the night and goes roaring off down the street in her night clothes, uh, being chased by the husband waving a smoking, you know, a smoking chair leg over, the, over his head, which happened on one occasion. In summation then, gentlemen, I think the problem that I face is that I'm not going to yank people around and move them around like little toy soldiers when parties more or less agree that if it isn't going to be only a two-week delay, at least it'll be not much more than a two-week delay. Uh, with, that un with that understood, and no evidence that the wife and kids have got to leave the, uh, the uh, hospital, hostel uh, before any, you know, in any foreseeable future day, before any future foreseeable future date, uh, then as far as I'm concerned, um, uh, let's let it lie the way it stands. I'll make a mutual order that neither spouse is to harass the other. I'll make a mu mutual order that neither spouse is to remove the children from the jurisdiction without uh, the written consent of the other spouse or in the alternative for further order of the court. Thank you. Rather an abrupt ending, but the best editing job that I could do. Um, just a couple of preliminary comments. Both these materials in this videotape are not meant to be, per se, a how-to-do-it um, guide for you. What, what they're meant to be is an illustration of real life in terms of representing a battered spouse. Um, in this fact situation, you didn't have clear-cut proof that there had been a serious assault. There, there was suggestive evidence, but nothing that was conclusive. And the husband had a plausible, um, response to the wife's allegations of violence. Um, having said that, let me explore with Master Cork some of the issues that, that came up in these materials and, and in the videotape. Master Cork, I think a lot of us who represent battered spouses um, often assume that the court is going to find if spousal violence is proved that it's relevant to the issue of custody and it's relevant right away to the issue of access. Do you share that view? Do you make that assumption when you're sitting? Well, first of all, if it is well defined, it being um, um, spousal violence of one sort or another, if it's well defined, fine, that's your first step. The second step then is, does it have any relevancy to the issues that are before me? If it has no relevancy, then all I can do is sympathize, but there's nothing I can do, sort of quasi-general damages. Um, so I effectively, with the deepest respect, probably ignore it. Um, it's another little bit of color, which uh, I see quite often, uh, but it has no real fundamental bearing on that which I'm asked to do. To take an example, perhaps, uh, on a cross-application for custody of a child, does abuse play a part as between the parents? Um, I would say sometimes, but not always. Uh, especially if it turns out that the child is well apt to be able to look after his or herself in the situation and is not really a part or party to the abuse, directly or indirectly, if that can be done. So I don't know if I've answered the question, uh, because it's sort of a gray area to start off with, but... Uh, I think you have. I think what you're saying is that you won't assume that because Mr. Smith beats his wife that that necessarily detracts from his ability to parent. No, I, quite right, quite right, quite right, quite right. And would I be right in saying then that if, if I want you to draw that conclusion, you will be looking to me as solicitor for the wife to provide, let's say, some expert evidence saying that in 
90% of the cases involving abusive spouses, um, these bad results have been seen in terms of parenting, their, those same spouses parenting their children. But yeah, I, I would need something more than the simple existence um, uh, in my league uh, of an allegation of abuse. Um, I would have to have a very strongly provable, proven um, pattern of abuse of quite serious nature which I suppose to some degree affects my mental image of both of the spouses, uh, presumably the wife uh, to the point where she is struggling only just for, she, she's really struggling for her own personal survival as well, of course, the survival of the children, if, if the husband is the batterer, um, and also affects the, my image of the husband as, um, human being. <laughs> Put it that way. Um, um, can a battering husband be a good father? I say fundamentally, I meet them all all halfway, and so I'd say yes, of course, because that relates not to his ability to care for, ch for children, but his relationship with a wife. Um, but it does affect, you know, your, your approach, especially if, if there is a very serious situation of, uh, of life or limb that maybe that I don't know. yeah I, I think it's hard to make generalities <laughs> we're thinking around this issue and that's yeah. what I want people to it's to very hard on. very hard for me to make a blanket definition um, in this whole area of matrimonial law very hard for me to make a blanket definition of, 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 of something because I prefer, as I say, right off the bat, we might as well understand each other. Spouses deserve each other, right? That's, that's fundamental. You, you cannot go into what I do uh, uh, without accepting that as, a, as, the, as the primary thesis. So there it is. we representing the battered spouse can't go in automatically assuming that if we prove battering, that sets off a whole set of assumptions no. in your mind that, for example, he's not entitled to custody. No, I, okay. I think you're right. Um, let me just turn to an, another um, strategy consideration that I think often affects lawyers representing battered spouses that came up in this case, and that's the question of timing and when you bring your application. Um, in this particular case, the wife had, for a variety of reasons, like mostly connected to do with legal, it had waited a month before she brought the application, so the children had been with her for a month without any move by the husband to get custody. Um, and when you were hearing the application, counsel for the wife indicated to, uh, to you that the, the matter was, was still going to be expedited, um, that the cross-examinations would be expedited. Um, how, how important was it to you when you were hearing that, that motion um, that the children had been, the status quo, that the children had been with the wife for a month, husband hadn't done anything? Well, the passage of the month in importance, um, or maybe I should define that better, the passage of the month without any negative or, or, or overt consequence during that month does play a part in my approach. But I recognize the practicalities of how they got there in the first place, and that itself is probably uh, one of the most tumultuous experiences that the wife and the children will probably ever have in their lives. I, I recognize that. And also the father. Um, thank God there are such places as, as hostels for people in that predicament to go to. Um, it is not, however, a pivotal thing. I am still, I like to think, still in a court of law. And I need evidence, I need factual evidence upon which to rely. The key is not the length of time it took for the lady to get her counsel before me, which took a month. The key is how long it was going to take after that to come back on fact. That's the key to this whole, this whole affair. Frankly, with the sincerest respect to Mr. Sir, 
Sirtash? Sirtash, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, to uh, Mr. Sirtash, he resolved the whole issue in the first line of his first opening key. First opening key. He said we were going to. He said we are going to adjourn for two weeks to have cross examinations and come back. At that point, the whole thing was resolved, as far as I was concerned. I didn't know it then. I came back after hearing the evidence. But 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 the key that I I have is 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 one of simply the passage of time. Um, I will accept, with respect to the people who run these uh, uh, these uh, hostels, I will accept the uh, the fundamental thing that uh, the concept that the children and wife certainly are not happy living as refugees in the hostel and would very much like to go home. But with only a couple of weeks to get, get the facts nailed down, and considering the husband has every equal right to claim that which he has claimed, as the wife has claimed, uh, I, I need facts. I, I need re resolution. I need resolution of issue. Then it comes up to us to have to bite the bullet, and we do the best we can then with, on facts. Hi, Penny Jones wants to ask you a question. Can I ask you what yeah. you would do when you say you're going to bite the bullet? Okay, we come back in two weeks. <laughs> I was afraid somebody would ask that. We've got the examination, and we're in the first right, You're right back where you were before. You can't prove that the wife is lying, you can't prove the husband is lying, and now what do you do? Which is not that unusual, right? <laughs> no, it's not that unusual. <laughs> yeah. Ah, shoot. Well, giving, given, yeah, I, 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 you have to understand that I make my living grasping at straws as I drown. You appreciate that, Miss Jones. Um, perhaps even, perhaps sympathize in occasion, perhaps, I hope. Um, what would I do? You come back and it's exactly the same way. First of all, as far as tactics are concerned, and I must confess that I do practice a certain amount of disjointed, socialized, cerebral medicine in my courtroom. Um, uh, I would probably lean on the husband, who I desperately hope would be there, listening to all this, asking him uh, through this counsel if he really understands that if the good lady and the kids have got to go, three, three kids, wouldn't they? Three kids in this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Three kids uh, are all have to go off and live someplace. Obviously, this man is just going to turn blue trying to work enough money or earn enough money to be able to pay for their ability to live off in lonely splendor someplace else while he lives in lonely splendor in the old matrimonial home. Um, and recognizing the inescapable fact that uh, one person out in a room someplace ex consumes far less money than one adult and three little people would. Um, if that didn't work, then um, <laughs> I would have to come to the conclusion, I think, that if there was a place for the father to go if the, under the act, and now I'm falling back, not on custody, but on uh, the issue of possession. Um, if there was a place for the father to go, which probably there isn't, and if they could afford it, which probably they couldn't, I would probably have to say then that, and I, here's, here, here comes the bullet, you see, I'd have to kick him up. Because I can't have the kids living in the, in the, mat, in, in, in the hostel forever. Um, you know, it's sort of hard for them to go and go to the university graduation, you know, it's ridiculous, you know. <laughs> um, so something's got to be done. I don't have the facilities nor the time to sell a matrimonial home and free up, uh, free up money uh, that they can both and everybody consume with a happy time until they get to travel. Uh, what else can I do? What really else can I do is to just literally turf them out. It may not be fair, but it's practical. Most of us do, I discovered in this business, yeah. They, okay, they're, they're, they're both, say their only asset for this is material housing apartments. You know? Yeah. This becomes one of the most frustrating um, applications of the bringing frame. He has absolutely nothing. He's got a disability pension. She comes in with the children. She alleges uh, the assault. Uh, he says, I have absolutely nowhere to go. I have to go to George Street to throw me out. Um, but she alleges that he assaults her. Why should the financial criteria become uh, I've been faced with it where you've gone financial and put everybody back in there. So said, I'm not going to throw this man out, he's got nowhere to go. Um, it seems to me that the assaultive part should be more relevant. And she won't go back in. They, because of your decision, she doesn't go back in. Then what do we do? 
hire Maybe a social worker. I think that's really all there is to do. I, I, you have to understand there's a very practical limit to how far I can go under the law. I can't make it better. I can only handle the mess that they've given me. And you have to understand that all the messes that are given me are insoluble because if they were soluble, they wouldn't be there. Well, I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. Oh, I've done it. I, I, as a matter of fact, on occasion, I've even given custody of the children to the house. <laughs> sure, sure. And let the, let the father and mother rotate back and forth. It lasts for a while. It's never really, to my recollection, ever worked completely. But effectively, I've put the kids back in the house and said, okay, fine, let the, you know, leave it. But your case... You see, the problem is there are no alternatives in your in your case. The kid either, you know, the man either sleeps in a in a packing case over a grate someplace in downtown Toronto, or 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 the kids and uh, and, and and the wife stay at Nelly's. Uh, what you know, what kind of a alternative is that? And and yet I can't take them home with me. What do I do? I don't know. You see, I have no facilities. I try. I try to. And I try to maintain the kids and the, and, and the wife together. Let me just ask you a couple more questions arising out of, of Penny's questions that, that I think we're all interested in. Let's say you, you initially mentioned timing settled this. Let's say if when you were hearing this motion, which is not all that different than Penny's fact situation, um, wife's counsel hadn't said, oh, we're going to expedite and be back here in two weeks. And instead, it was the more normal fact situation where you can expect that will be at least two or three months before they're back before you. And the wife and the children would have been sitting in the hostel for that period of time. Is, is that a significant factor to you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't want to create any bad ill will here, but um, I, I do feel because of the very nature of the hostile system that probably children do not necessarily axiomatically have to blossom when within it. Um, so on that basis, yeah, um, it, it, it comes to be a, 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 an issue of time. Um, I would have to say then, I'm sorry, buddy, I don't care whether you beat your wife up. The problem is not whether you beat your wife. The problem is that the wife and the kids are out and you're in. And what I take from that is that probably we, we should be careful about um, quick offers to expedite when we're arguing these, these matters before. I, that's just, yeah, I sympathize with that statement, but no, uh, I, I, you see, there are always two sides to a question. One of the fundamental problems, and I'm the first to concede that I still have it, uh, even after being, you know, here to these type of affairs in the past, uh, that one of the things that bothers me is if, if there's a consistency of beating in this age now of Ontario housing, public health, um, um, Nellies and, and all these hostels and things like that, um, it seems to me that if, if somebody beat me up, I'd get the hell out, even with the kids. And, and I have trouble accommodating that, that fundamental mindset of so many women who I meet across the